Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Tim Vixay with my crippled friend, and this is episode number 49. And uh, we're continuing to do these um, in unconventional methods. I'm on the phone right now with uh, Chris Cook. He is a quadriplegic from the Bay Area. Uh, he's a wheelchair rugby Hall of Famer. And um, Chris, did you play with anyone this year? Yeah, uh, the High Five Sierra Storm. We um, we were all good to go to Nationals until everything got canceled. Right. Um, but the bottom line is, yeah, I was for the first time in, I think, six years, I was back on the court. Um, traditionally, I was a .5, but because of age, class down to a class zero. I wanted to be the best nothing ever. Did uh, And you guys, what did you guys finish in, at sectionals? Uh, we won our section. Well, no, we didn't have to go to sectionals because – um, we were number eight, so we launched into into Division One at the bottom end. Oh, okay. Did you guys have an import this year? Yeah, we did. We had Matt Lewis come in from Australia. Oh, right on. I know, I know, Louie. Yeah, yeah, great dude. He actually stayed at my house here with my mom and I um, for about two months, and we got to know each other pretty well. And he's he's just a solid guy, great guy. Oh, right on. Yeah, last time I saw him was uh, a couple of years ago. We were in Bali. Yes. You told me about that, actually. He's been playing all over the con- or all over the world, really. Um, he was obviously from Australia, and then he, I think he's played for a couple of club teams in Japan. Yeah, I believe. I, in- don't quote me. I think he was playing with Okinawa. That sounds right. So, yeah, he's been doing that for a while. Um, he did leave the Australian national team. Um, oh, did he? To go back to school. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, he left them like three years ago. I want to say 2017. I could be wrong on that. Mm. But he left after the Paralympics. They won gold, and um, he decided to go after his PhD. Oh, good for him. I mean. Yeah, totally. I'm sure they're, Australia's got a way better uh like stipend program than the u.s athletes but even then i don't think you can make a living playing wheelchair rugby right um in your i don't know how many years you've been playing has has nationals ever been canceled like this no never that's all right so i'll give you a little history lesson here um i started playing in 1988 1987 was the first nationals and it was in la and um 88 through, I believe, 04, I went to every Nationals. I took three years off in 80, or 04 to 07. And then um, I was in a car accident and um, post-injury. And uh, my neck and shoulders were kind of messed up for a little bit. I finally gave up on Western medicine and went and had some acupuncture done, and it cleared everything up. So I started playing again in 07. And I think I met you not long after that. I was playing for the Vegas team and just helping out. They were kind of brand new. And, um, you know, it was Mike Shock and Eric Wolf. And yeah, I think, I think we had first met in 09 at the Low Point Tournament. That sounds right. I'm pretty sure it was in Vegas. Yeah. I know yeah. exactly where it was. We were on Fremont Street. And um, you just came rolling up and we were – I can't remember. Was I with Shock? Or maybe you were. Anyway, bottom line is we started talking, and we've been friends ever since. I don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, mentor and... No. You, you, you describe it then. That's a weird relationship. It's a... I don't know. Sometimes it's like you're like a father figure, and then sometimes you're like a coach, but then sometimes you're just like a, <laughs> you're like a drinking buddy. <laughs> okay all of the above can we just say we're friends even if it's weird I don't, I don't i don't like to put terms like that on things okay we won't label anything tim yeah we don't have to define You're just the guy on the microphone right now we don't have to we're def- gonna talk we don't have to define the relationship that's true the uh, definition is um clearly a problem for you <laughs> 
Um, how do you um, how do you guys think you would have done at nationals if uh, we would have been That's able? That's a good question. Um, frankly, I think we could have won a game, maybe two, mm-hmm. but overall, uh, we didn't have the depth and certainly didn't have the experience. So, um, you know, I'm the most experienced guy, and I'm going to be 59 this year. Okay. And congratulations. Is, thank you. And Matt's probably, along with Ed Olson, the most, other most experienced guys. But other than that, we had a lot of youngsters, and they were hungry. And we, you know, we wanted this opportunity. But, I don't know, like defining a relationship, how do I prognosticate how we would have done? I think if we took sixth or fifth, that would have been huge. However, yeah. um it's realistic, I think. Um, frankly, I didn't want anything to do with D1, but we ended up beating uh, Phoenix 2 in the finals of the D2 at the Rave, and that launched us right into D1. Yeah. The, um, D2 would have been really interesting to see. Um, yeah, I think so, too. Especially... You I- know, we played, we played Boise twice. And we beat them both times. And to me, it was uh, probably really between Boise and Phoenix, too. I, I could be wrong, though, because I haven't seen everybody. But yeah, I mean, Atla- Atlanta was playing some really solid rugby down at, uh, at our sectionals. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I haven't seen everybody, but, you know, I've seen a lot of film. And I think, I think that's pretty accurate, but who knows? Moving forward, though, because I was wondering, because, you know, I was um, obviously, you know, I've, I've been involved with Oscar Mike since the beginning, and we were supposed to be hosting nationals. And uh, right, right. The, the like four days before we made the call to cancel it, we um, we had all the, the, the guys that were building the trophies. Uh, they dropped it off oh, at the uh, at the house at the compound. And yeah. now we're like, it's just sitting there. Um, if you watch some of my old episodes, uh, I actually have one of the wheels propped up on the table. But we're like, what are we supposed to do with this thing now? Like, are we just not going to have a champion for this year? Or like, what do we do? Do we take like a, you know, like an AP vote? No, not, not in my eyes. I think uh, it, it's canceled for a good reason. And while none of us wanted this, of course, it is what it is, and I think the USQRA board and perhaps you folks, you made the right decision. At first, I, I wasn't on board. I was like, come on, let's play ball. And then as we got into this coronavirus a little bit more, I was like, wow, this, this is really, truly serious. And for to have all those people get on an airplane, bad, very bad. So, I mean, I'm not saying that anybody would have been exposed at the actual games, but just getting there could have been a real issue. Oh, so yeah. You asked, you asked me earlier if anything has been canceled like this before national. I would say no. There has been a couple, at least one asterisk year, I think 2016. We can all agree on that. Um, but other than that, this is, this is, you know, a whole new territory for us. Yeah, it's interesting. That's why I was wondering, like, I don't know if there's, like, a a protocol in place or do we just, we just don't have I don't a, think so. Yeah, we just don't I, have I, a, I spoke, you know, I do the podcast with Mike uh, Klonowski and, and Dave Menchin, and um, so we talk pretty frequently on and off the record, and um, there's no protocol for this as far as I know. I mean, it's just, that's going to be a, blank year on the trophy yeah that's interesting we'll launch into 2021 once we get all the air cleared here yeah i think what we're gonna have to do is just send those trophies back and then have them kind of laser cut that last zero out and just make it a one yes just use some white out you can make it happen oh no this trophy i mean it's like it's a it's a rugby wheel with like a metal plate on it that's been laser cut and it says you know oh, cool. us cure national champions 2020 so. nice 
We're, we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to fab up some some ones. Uh, we're gonna have to what? We're gonna have to like just fab up some like some little ones that we can just weld right on the end there. Yeah. <laughs> how uh, we don't have to get in too deep into it, but how uh, how's life been in the lockdown down there in, in the Bay Area? Well, yeah, I think my, uh, well, in the Bay Area, start with in general. Um, I think we've been really fortunate. I think uh, the governor, um, Gavin Newsom, who I'm not very political at all, but I will say this. He went to my high school and grew up about two blocks from me, um, but he's quite a bit younger. In any case, I think he did a great job. I think he, um, he got us in lockdown pretty much one of the first states that really – just you know what we were all in and um i mean i go to the store for necessities about every three days but are you that, uh are you wearing a mask when you go out am i what are you wearing a mask or anything uh no i haven't worn a mask and <laughs> call me a rebel but it um it also fogs up my glasses and i can't see when i'm in a damn store um but I'd have worn gloves, rugby gloves, as a matter of fact, shopping mm. with rugby gloves. And, um, yeah, uh, most people are pretty conscientious, I'd say. The six-foot thing is definitely in effect. And there's wipes all over the store. You can grab a wipe and, and keep on moving. Or you, I actually bring my own little hand pump of sanitizer. And anytime I touch anything that... I know somebody's just touched, and I um, I use it, and you know, knock on wood, I don't think I don't think any of us are immune, obviously, but I'm taking every precaution possible. Meanwhile, at home, um, I think some of you guys know, but my mom has Alzheimer's, and she's um, 88 years old, and so she's been sort of sheltered in place for about a year and a half. Um, she doesn't go out much anymore. And so I'm managing uh, four people that are coming in as caregivers and making sure they stay clean and, you know, conscientious about everything, wearing gloves. And um, some of them like to use a mask, some don't. Um, I'm not going to require it, but I do tell them anytime you're preparing food or doing anything around my mom or me, um, please be real conscientious of that. Um, So that's sort of been our gig. My mom's been if you will, sheltered in place for about a year and a half. So this is nothing new for her. And I'm really, really pleased to find out that this is all working in our house because my aunt, for instance, who's in her 90s, is in a uh, assisted living facility in Seattle. She oh, hasn't yeah. Seen... It's horrible. It's horrible. That's got to be scary. She's not been out of her room, had anybody be able to come in her room except for staff, and that's very limited for five weeks. And she's going nuts and she's totally with it. She's cognitive in terms of, um, you know, no dementia or anything, but she's in her nineties. She said to me the other day on the phone, she goes, I'm going to spend my last days in this freaking place alone without a choice. I mean, she might be right. It's horrible. You should try maybe Skyping with her. Well, we, She's not very technologically advanced. I mean, if you think I'm bad, she doesn't have email. She doesn't have a cell phone. So I've asked my cousin Dave to, you know, get over there. and Maybe we'll do some FaceTime with my mom or Skype or something, but it hasn't happened yet. And plus, they won't let him in. Right, yeah. And here's what it's really about, Tim. They had 19 people die. You might have heard this, I believe, in a Kirkland um, Kirkland, Washington. Is that right? Yep. Am I confusing that with Brian? No, Kirkland. So they had a facility early on, like four or five weeks ago, maybe longer now. There are 19 people died. Yeah, the so they are the retirement totally homes were the ones away. that were getting hit pretty hard early. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So I have a question. Do you actually know somebody who has this? Do I know someone? Um, yeah. No, I mean outside of outside of the celebrities, you know Kevin Kevin Durant and uh, right. Joe Joe Diffie. 
Right. I just found out yesterday, well, no, on Monday, that um, one of my high school friends I've known since the late 70s, um, he's, he's dealing with it right now, and he's, um, he was reluctant to get tested. He thought he just had a cold. He finally got tested and tested positive, and he's had it for three weeks, I believe. And, um, yeah, I, I just reached out to him yesterday and kind of got the details. It sucks, man. Yeah, it's crazy. What's really crazy is a lot of people like still think it's just a big hoax. It's like, no, come well, on, pe- come if on. You're talking about if you're talking about politically related, um, I'm going to stay away from that. But I have no idea. But it, it, as far as I can see and read and hear, and it's very real. Right. Yeah. No. I just it. I don't. I don't get why everything has to get political because it's like the everything's everything's right in front of us you know we're, we're looking at people uh, you know what just drop you know like it's political oh, of course of course first of all it's an election year yeah. secondly we are no longer the united states we're the divided states and people want to blame people and you know i i said i wasn't going to get into this here i go anyway that's sort of my thought yeah, it's um, it's scary for me. It's like I I I've seen what happens when like shit kind of hits the fan, and what I'm really worried about is like when shit really hits the fan. Like this, to me, this this just seems like it's just like a dry run. Like it's just kind of like a hey, just a reminder that there yeah. there are you know bad things out there that you can't just bomb your way out of with, you know, drones. Right. Um, right. So I don't know. It's scary. It, it's kind of made me kind of rethink so, uh, a lot of my. So I will say this. I, I was around. I'm quite a bit older than you, but I was around in the 1989 earthquake that hit the Bay Area. And it was 7.1 Loma Prieta on the San Andreas, San Andreas Fault. And I saw how the community came together and everybody, I mean, the Bay Bridge was closed and the Richmond Bridge and the San, um, Golden Gate Bridge um, were closed temporarily while they made sure there wasn't structural damage. So people that wanted to continue to go to work, whatever, they were screwed. And this is before cell phones. This is before, well, not exactly. You could well, the wide phone, use, like the wide use of cell phones. You had you had to have a shoebox to put it in, but I mean it was you know back then it was pretty primitive. The, what I'm getting at the point is, it seems to me this is a pretty apples and orange comparable situation where this community is coming together again and people are trying to do the right things to make sure nobody is infected, so they're staying home. And a lot of that happened at the earthquake in '89. People were trying to help people that you know homes were destroyed or there was fires or all of that and people stayed home and didn't you know inundate inundate the freeways because the bridges were down too and it's it's you know it's just a a wide angle comparison but i think people at their root are very good and they want to help people um yeah communities coming together yeah it's um it's weird because I I've seen. I mean, when I was living out, when I, you know, for the first half of this whole pandemic, I was actually out in Illinois. Um, I just got back to right. or, I got back to Oregon. Did you uh, fly? I home? think it's been no. I drove. It's been like three weeks now. Yeah. That was a. We can talk a little bit about that. That was a hell of a drive. I um. Yeah, I bet. I pretty much just drove uh thirty six hours straight. Um, didn't want to cool. didn't want to stop in a hotel. Um, so yeah, for, for 36 hours, I was just in, in my truck, uh, didn't even, uh, wow. didn't even leave once. You know, I had, uh, had enough piss bottles. Um, I had, uh, had some blankets and a pillow to lay down across the front bench seat. Cause you know, it's in my, my pickup nice. truck. So I got the, the bench seat. Oh, I got you. Yeah. So when I, when I would get tired, if my butt got sore, I would just, uh, pull over, uh, you know, like a Walmart or 
wherever and just lay down, get off my butt for a little bit. Um, right. Yeah. And then I just, you know, packed, packed enough snacks. I didn't, didn't really, um, I think I stopped at McDonald's once and then I stopped at Popeye's once, but <laughs> nice. Then, uh, oh, yeah, red just beans and rice. My favorite. <laughs> oh, from Popeye's. Yeah. Popeye's red beans and rice. Good I've stuff. been all about their, uh, chicken sandwiches. Yep. They're good too. Yeah. I don't even know why that was up for debate against Chick-fil-A. I was like this, <laughs> the sandwich is blow the spicy chicken sandwich just blows it away. So. Anyways, that's enough about the lockdown. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to drag people down. Actually, I'd like to. Sh- I'd like to share one more thing. Yeah, go so ahead. I was a. Um, I was teaching pretty regularly. I took early retirement um, a few years back when my when my mom got sick, and um, I was living an hour and a half away, and it was clear she couldn't live anymore on her own. Mm-hmm. So I moved in with her. I'm an only child. My dad passed in 2010. And so with all that said, um, I'd already been over here and I was substitute teaching. I've been a uh, teacher 32 years and I was substitute teaching after retirement. And it was a great gig. I had a great gig going and then all this happens. I actually worked the last day. It was March the 2nd or 3rd. I can't remember. Anyway, I worked the last day. No, it was a Thursday. So the schools were closed the next day, Friday, for teacher meetings and then have been closed ever since. And they really don't think they're not going to reopen before summer. So this was an eighth grade class I was teaching. And um, so these kids won't get to get, have their little graduation party, et cetera, et cetera. It'll all be virtual. Yeah, prom, anyway, prom got me, canceled. Oh, yeah. No, all that stuff has gone. So... The point I'm making, though, is um, I then got this job teaching four of the special ed kids in the school remotely on computer. And I guess money's tough. I understand that for everybody. Um, So they were paying me pretty well. And the bottom line is I got an email last week. I had been working with these kids for three, four weeks. I got an email last week saying, we no longer need your services. And I was like, why? What's going on here? So I called my director to try and get an explanation. Well, they hired two college kids um, and are paying them one third of what they were paying me. And that's why they dismissed me. And so it is what it is. I'm still working with one kid, actually. Um, he and I have been together now for like three months, um, 12 year old. But anyway, um, Everybody's hurting, and so that's one way government was cutting spending, and uh, they let let me go. Do you? Um, I actually have this a little bit further down on my list, but um, do you think? Because um, man, we're gonna have to skip ahead. Um, so, um, like you said, you, you've been you've been a teacher for thirty two years from all sorts of levels, right? From what I remember, you were doing middle school and even high school for a little bit there. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, I started out teaching third, fourth grade. Um, I was already in the chair and didn't really work for me because they were my height and they (laughs) liked me and they were hugging me all the time. And the next thing you know, I was sick every day. (laughs) Oh yeah. This not working out. Plus, I don't know. I just found that that grade level a little more needy than, than I really was up to. Um, so in my career, I primarily did middle school, um, total of 21 years. And I did, uh, that's gotta be tough school. too, though. Cause I remember being a middle schooler and I was kind of an asshole. Well, there's lots of them. However, here's what I usually tell people. Middle school kids, when they enter the building, don't already have their middle finger in the air. You can work with them. You can mold them. You can establish rapport and have a great middle school class. High school, on the other hand, there's a handful of kids, especially freshmen and sophomores, because the ones that don't really want to stick around for school haven't dropped out yet. So they are going to blow up the entire class. So I would prefer middle school. That's like figuratively Um, speaking. Right, right, right. (laughs) Um, 
Yeah, that was a metaphor. So, uh, but the bottom line is, uh, I loved middle school, particularly seventh grade, because sixth graders were kind of trying to figure it out. Eighth graders had one foot out the door. But seventh graders, those kids still wanted to do well, wanted to learn, were open to pretty much anything or everything. And I pretty much did everything and anything in classrooms. So I even, I even, you'll love this one. I had a really big classroom. I brought an extra rugby chair and got in my rugby chair. And we had all the, the, um, the desks lined in a big circle in this big room. And we turned it into a mosh pit of wheelchair rugby in the middle. Nice. I would just go head to head with kids. And they loved it. They loved it. And so then I'd get some help, get out of my chair, and let them go head to head. And we created contests. And I remember my VP walked in one day. It was a rainy day. And he walks in and he looks at me and goes, Cook, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm teaching survival skills. And he goes, I love it. I love it. And he left. He just left me alone. So that was one of the reasons I like middle school. You could probably not pull that off in elementary. You would have had 30 emails at the end of the day from parents going, what the hell is going on in that room? Or high school, kids just, they wouldn't necessarily engage. They would be like, nah, it's not for me. Middle school, they all wanted to get in a chair. That's cool. The, um... How do you feel about these? Because uh, a lot of kids now are doing the video classes. Um, do you yeah, th- do you think, think that's so. like viable for the future? Like, are they getting the right education no. through that? Or I don't. I May mean, call me old school, but I I think it's very limited. Um, it's a band aid. It's what we have to do right now. I know that I've talked to a few friends who have college age kids. We've talked, and um, they're doing the same thing. They have no choice. But come on, to pay that kind of tuition, and I know I know we're all busy, but I think going to a class and getting the different feel of different classrooms, I'm talking back now about middle school or high school, um, it's, it's very worthwhile. It's very, um, it develops character, and it, it teaches you about people. I mean, sitting in front of your screen and learning, I don't know, that I I think it's a Band-Aid. I, I don't think it's – it might be the wave of the future, but it's not the wave of my future. I'll get out. I think I agree because it th- – there's something to be said about, like, um, that social interaction. Um, and it's not always going to be – it's not always going to be positive. You know, you also need, like, those negative interactions to to pretty right. much learn yeah, about the exactly. world, you know, because the world's not a, a padded place. You know, it's not – Exactly. It's not bubble wrapped for exactly. you. It's there's there's. I, you know, Tim, I've already I've already had some pretty extreme thoughts about uh, gamers, about video games, and uh, the lack of social activity that goes on if you're just sitting in front of your screen with a headphone on, playing with an inanimate object. Uh, you know, I, to me, it's it's not real. I mean, it, it can be fun and it can be addictive. I get it. But um, is it healthy? I don't know. Uh, maybe it's all those kids, yeah. But to do that, and I had plenty of students who they would go home and not do their homework and just be gaming all day long after they got out of school. Yeah, I think I think there needs to be a balance. Um, yes. I know when I was growing up, we weren't even, uh, me and, me and my uh, little brother, we weren't allowed to play video games uh during the week it was um only friday after school till i think it was 6 p.m on sunday those were those were our hours to game nice work Boutini. yeah excellent but i mean it, it led to some some like marathon binge sex you know uh sessions oh, i'm sure but I'm sure but then it was also like you know during the summer it's like i'm not gonna want to sit inside so it was like Right. You know, you're going to go out and play. Um, well, here, here's a thought for you, Tim. The personal computer, the first Apple, came out when I was a freshman in college. And so all those years before, we didn't even have that. I mean, it was a big deal to have a VHS player come home and 
watch a movie. Yeah. I mean, there was none of that. I mean, you see that or TV, or you went out. You went out and you played with your buddies. You never just sat in front of a screen. Yeah, which is kind of weird because, like, right now, you know, during our quarantine time, it's uh, it's kind of a blessing, but it's also people are just going crazy. Like, right now, I think, is the best time to ever be quarantined in the history of quarantines because you got, you know, home delivery and you got Uber Eats and you got Netflix yeah, that's and true. You, you, you got TV at your fingertips, but people are still losing their shit. And I think a lot of it just... It has to do with there's no real interactions. There's no, you know, everything is just through digital. Like, Right. Well, people go stir crazy. I get it. My, one of my best friends, he and I, <laughs> it's kind of funny actually, he and I would meet in a parking lot um, and just have a cocktail in our own cars five feet away from each other and talk. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I, after that, I would just, I'd go shopping and then I go home. <laughs> but yeah. it was good to have that interac- interaction with a good friend. Right. You know, other than being on a screen. Yeah. I agree. Um, I don't, I mean, besides doing this podcast and just, you know, texting people and, just interacting on like social media. Um, it's actually kind of been nice to just be able to just kind of right unplug. Um, I, I started yeah, doing, I start, cold. I started doing some puzzles just to kind of not be staring at the screen all the time. So, um, what were you doing? What are you doing? Uh, just a thousand piece little puzzle. Oh, puzzle. like a jigsaw. Yeah. A jigsaw puzzle. Right um, on. I've been I've actually That's been listening cool. I've been listening to a lot of books uh on Audible. Oh, good for you. Yeah. What books? What would you recommend? Ooh. Well, right now I am on a book called The People's History of the United States. Uh, uh Howard Zinn. Uh yeah. Have you uh have you read it? Howard Zinn. Oh yeah. I'm a history teacher, Tim. I've been using that book for twenty years. You teach that kind of history? Because yes, the history that I got taught in school was very Americanized, and um, yeah, we didn't we didn't cover a lot of the stuff that uh, I I think would have been a lot more interesting. Um, All right, let me tell you about something. So I got turned on to this book right after it came out. I don't remember when it was published, but so Howard Zinn, spelled Z I N N, yeah, is um, essentially. What would you call him? He's a historian, but he's also a philanthropist. And I believe he's one of these guys that is just an alternative sort of source. So, of course, we had our textbooks. And, yeah, they're, they're fine. They're pretty watered down. Um, understand, seventh grade history is world history from the fall of the Roman Empire until the Revolutionary War. And so I was using... Um, Zinn's book to supplement what we had in class and also some film and, you know, YouTube, stuff like that. But anyway, um, I found that Zinn, Zinn's stuff was, I think, real. And here's why. Because he took um, famous people's, we'll start with Christopher Columbus, for instance. He took Columbus's diary, everything Columbus wrote Mm -hmm. in his native language and translated it and printed it. It's not like he gave us, gave us, uh, you know, his own, um, opinion or view because he wasn't there. This came directly from Columbus's writings. And so with that said, um, you know, once again, age factor, I remember as a kid, we had Columbus day off and, and then, you know, I got into college and learned more and more about, who he really was, and I thought that was I the, don't know if it's the that was the first chapter in the book, yeah. right? Yes, it's the very first chapter. Yeah, those guys were savages. It, it, oh my god, crazy! I they killed millions of people, and it was documented, and they infected them with, you know, well, it was it, it was it was something like in, in, in people. 
in two years, I forget the name of the tribe that they ran into, and they, they weren't even in the um, mainland no. continental U.S. They were somewhere in the Bahamas, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, they were down in the islands. But they reduced this population in half from like 200,000 to 100,000 yeah. or less than 100,000 yeah. in like just two years. All, all over some gold. Yes. Well, they wanted to, okay, so to get his, you know about this already, but so they wanted to validate these these trips. And, and let's, let's give him credit. Columbus and his guys, I mean, he was a brilliant, brilliant um, explorer in terms of finding land when most people in the world at that time thought, well, you keep going, you're going to fall off the edge of the earth. No, that's not how it works. Uh, but the bottom line is that Columbus thought he was in India. That's why we call Native Americans or indigenous people Indian, which is totally wrong. And and then I think he was in the Hispan, Hispaniola. Is that right? I'm not positive. I haven't read in a while. But um, the bottom line is that um, they were uh, enslaving, killing, raping, pillaging, and all for the sake of bringing stuff home so he could validate his voyages and get more money to go and make more voyages. You know, what's really interesting uh, that I learned in that book was that um, he thought the earth was like a, actually like a third of its actual size. And if like the American continent wasn't yeah. there, they would have, yeah. they didn't have enough supplies to um, reach Asia at all. They would have just, Right. They would have just died. Right. No, it's a it's it's an interesting take. I'm on the um I'm just right. I think I just read. I think the Civil War just wrapped up, or it's about to kick oh, off. Oh wow, cool. Um, so cool. yeah, it's a it's a long book. Um, but, oh, I have a segue for us here. Yeah. So I found out well a, a while ago. So I'm an only only child. And I'm obviously the first son. I found out that the first son in the Cook family for the last four generations has all had, have all had a disability from the waist down and none of them were from birth. What Uh, other kind of disabilities? Like, like you got uh, some amputee grandpas. Yes. So let's start with the civil war. My great, let's see great great grandfather was a soldier for the rebels and the family was primarily the cook family was from um, south carolina north carolina and then later oklahoma and texas but anyway he was a um a soldier and he lost one leg in some battle and he survived for a bit after that Okay, then his son, they were moving, they had 14 children, but he was the oldest son. Um, They were moving from, I believe, the Carolinas to Oklahoma during the Civil War. No, that's not true. Much after that, like the late 1800s. And they um, had a wagon with uh, horses, and the kids were playing around the wagon, and one of the horses clipped this kid and dropped him and his leg was crushed by the wagon and he yeah and he they didn't have wheelchairs or anything that i know about but once they finally got settled he spent a great deal of time in an infirmary and then um they eventually amputated his leg and he lived he lived a pretty good life i can't can't even um, imagine that would have been getting amputated back then Oh my God! I'm sure it was just like here's the saw. I mean, and, even um, even a you know, hundred even a hundred years ago, it had been brutal. But now it's <laughs> you're talking 150 <laughs> years. Like this, have a have a couple shots of bourbon, and we're gonna saw your leg off. Yeah, we but go. bite down on this. Yeah, right. So anyway, um, then my father uh, was born with both legs normal. He was born in 1928, and. By 1930, right in the middle of the Depression, um, he contracted polio. And so he was post-polio, and he did not walk again until he was six. He had like five different operations, 
And so, you know, I grew up with, with him always limping and, I, you know, when you're a kid, you don't really question it. It's just, that's my dad. That's what he does. Yeah. And then, um, and then of course at age 18, I had my spinal cord injury. So four generations of cooks, the first son all had something, legs and none from birth. Man, it's just the uh, bad luck of the draw, I guess. Yeah. Are you guys are just kids, you guys are you guys are just risk takers? Something like that. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about your injury because you um you kind of have one of the more unique ones. You know, usually the ones that I have are like diving and driving are like the two top ones. Um, right. And then I got a couple guys that you know got injured um, overseas uh, in the military, but um. No, let's uh, let's talk about your injury a little bit. So, okay. So I was an athlete all my life, played lots of sports in grade school, middle school, high school, um, and found out about rugby um, when senior year in high school, um, my football career was essentially over, And um, although I did try out in, in college. But anyway, um, a guy came to our school, we had a big school, 2,800 kids, and a guy came to our school, and um, we, soccer and football season had just ended, and he just started recruiting guys, and he's like, hey, let's, uh, we're going to start a rugby team, and I was like, really, what's that like, and so he brought a film in, and showed us, and I was into it, it was great, and so um, I started playing rugby in high school, and our first year, we had... He actually, really wait, hold up. <laughs> he actually brought like one of those reel to reel films? No, it was a VHS. Okay. He had, I don't know, somehow. Yeah, but he brought a film in of, I think it was college rugby. I can't quite remember. But I had never seen the game. I had no idea what it was. Um, and I was totally down with it. And so I started playing rugby my senior year in high school. What uh, What position did you play? that would have been the headphones dropping off my head. So anyway, I was uh, totally into it. We started our first team. Uh, we only had 17 guys and 15 play at a time. And we won the state championship first year. Oh, there nice. was only like 10 or 12 teams in California playing rugby. Well, at least that showed up to this event. And we called it the state championship. I'm sure there were other teams out there, but, you know, we didn't play them all. So anyway, that was at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. It was pretty exciting. So then um, I went to Davis for undergrad, and um, my I tried out for football, and I actually made the team. It's a long story. I won't get into it. But I made the team. I was going to be like the 50, 57th guy on a 60-man team, and I wasn't going to be – traveling at all and yet and yet the uh coach wanted us in the gym five hours a day plus we had a full full load of school and i quit i quit the team and i went out for the rugby team in college and that's when i got injured what happened was for those of you that have seen rugby before um, the two scrums got together eight people in each scrum come together my job was um the hook i was the hooker in the middle, um, probably because I had big feet. I was pretty strong. And um, I hooked the ball back to my teammate on a very sloppy, uh, rainy sort of day. And um, it was November 22nd, 1980. And so the scrum collapsed. And when it collapsed, I went down and hit my head forward. And then... Um, about 10 people rolled on top of me and I injured my neck and I didn't know what was going on. I was 18 years old and basically I was yelling. I was, I was totally conscious. I, I knew something was wrong, terribly wrong, but I didn't know what. And so I didn't hear a crack or a break or anything like that. Um, but what happened was my spinal cord got pinched between five and six, C five and six. And, um, I couldn't get up and they called the, uh, we called for an ambulance. It just so happened we were on the campus at UC Davis. 
Oh, and we were playing our alumni, who were much bigger and much stronger, and it was a 10 a.m. game, and most of them were already drunk. <laughs> so it was one of those deals. Um, and then the other part was that I was I had made the varsity team um, as a freshman, but I was second string. And so the guy that was supposed to be in there in front of me, he was too hammered from the night before to play. So these guys come up to me and go, hey, Cook, you want to play with the varsity first team today? I'm like, yes. And that's why I was in there. Oh, so I was man. also with people I was unfamiliar with and hadn't really practiced much with. And I think that contributed in some ways to the injury because uh, we just didn't have that chemistry. And they let go of me in the scrum when it started collapsing. And I went down. I think the whole left side of the scrum went down. But I went down a very precarious way. And that's how I, I was injured. And um, from there, did you, you – I mean, they took you to the ER. But uh, when um, – like, when did you get that the news, like, hey, you're never going to walk again? Oh, uh, yeah. That, you know, everyone gets that. Yeah. That initial doctor or whoever comes in and goes, son. Son, you're never going to walk. We have to talk. We have to talk. And so uh, I was wearing my brand new rugby jersey back then, 1980, that I had paid 50 bucks for. Damn, so that's a lot of money years. back then. That was a big deal. And so they have transported me to the medical center in Sacramento. And, um, oh, and I also had a cold at the time. And it, my left lung collapsed almost immediately. And I got pneumonia within three days. Jeez, that would not have been good now for sure. But anyway, um, the doctor came out. The attending physician at emergency comes out. And he takes his scissors out. And I'm totally awake. And I'm on my back, just laying there with, you know, the collar on. And he starts to cut my jersey. And I went, hey, 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 I paid 50 bucks for that. <laughs> and he just stared at me. And he said, son, we're talking about what you'll ever walk again. And I went, okay, cut it. <laughs> oh, man. That's, that's, that was my, uh, you know, my come to Jesus wake up call. That's oh, that's a hun that's a hundred and fifty six dollars and ninety six cents. <laughs> Very nice. That, that's like a that's New like pounds. a that's like a pro NBA jersey, I think. Dude, it was a great jersey. It just didn't last long. Oh man. Um. So what? Uh. Obviously, you, you you held off on going to school for a while, but um, how long till I don't know? You'd say. You got you got things rolling again. Well, okay. So first of all, for all you all you kids out there, um, they didn't have lightweight wheelchairs then. Um, this is 1980. I think 1982 or three came out the quadra chair and the uh, the first quickie quickie one. Anyway, my chair they sent me home with. Well, first of all, I was in rehab for four and a half months. I had a couple of near-death experiences like most of us do. I told you about the pneumonia. Um, I went from 180 down to 122 in three weeks and they thought I was checking out and it turned out I had blood clots and collapsed left lung and pneumonia, the whole bit. Anyway, I had great support from family and friends and they were there every day telling me, you know, you're not only going to live, you're going to do well. Just, you know, shut the fuck up and let's go. And I was like, okay, all right, all right. And this is one of the reasons well, I'm here now with my mom is because she traveled from north of San Francisco to San Jose an hour and a half each way every day for four and a half months to make sure that I was getting good care. And, you know, the least I can do is help her out when she's aging and dealing with Alzheimer's. So anyway, the bottom line though is um, I came home in an Everson Jennings everyday chair that weighed 55 pounds Ooh. and I could barely push it. I also came home with a Everson Jennings power chair and it was, you know, that's 
what I had to do. And so I actually came back after moving out and going to college, came back to live with my parents in April. Wow. Holy moly. Today's April 15th, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah. I came back to live with my parents on April 15th, 1981. Okay. So, so shit, 39? 39 years ago today. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be 40. I'll be 40 in my second life in November this year. Damn. So, um, I know, right? That's like... Because you got hurt when you were 18, so, so that's like... Or you've already like yeah, twice yeah. folded it. <laughs> and, and I turned 59 a week later, November 29th. It was, it, was, it was a big deal. I had my birthday, you know, a week after, and they all thought I was dying, and it was, it was crazy. Um, but anyway, um, I got a lightweight chair about four years later, I think. I went back to school in September of 81 and did my degree. You went back to UC and, Davis uh, or? Yeah, I went back to Davis. I went back to my school. Um, I'd only really been there one quarter. So I had three classes. Um, two of them gave me an incomplete. One of them gave me a grade. So at the, at this point, out. were you were you independent enough to go back and actually live on campus? Oh, no. Or? Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Um, no, not at all. Um, I had about... Uh, let's see, probably about 10 hours a day of, of caregiving service. Um, and I didn't, Tim, I found out about rugby eight years later in 88. And it changed my whole independence thing. I was already, you know, able to um, dress myself a little bit, go to the bathroom, sort of. I, I needed help for everything still. Mm -hmm. When I found out about rugby, I saw people that were doing stuff, and I was like, damn, I can do that. Maybe I can do that. And I'm going to credit Nils Jorgensen, um, lifelong friend, wheelchair rugby player, fellow Hall of Famer. Um, he and I were housemates, and he goes, you can do all this stuff. And if you want, um, I'll show you a few things. Now, he's a class two. He's got full triceps, et cetera. But his encouragement and what I was seeing at rugby tournaments, traveling with an attendant, by the way, or phoning ahead and saying, hey, is there somebody on your end that can help me? Yeah. They need a lot of help. But I needed some stuff. And, um, yeah, just kind of figured it out. Figured it out after about eight years, I'd say. Be, no, longer. Maybe 10 to 11 years, I became fully independent. That's great. I mean, I know it, it took me some time, but, um, you know, our stories are kind of similar where it wasn't until I got involved with rugby. I mean, it, it was a lot sooner than, than when you were introduced to it. Um, but it, yeah, no, it was, it was watching, um, guys like you and, you know, like Max Woodbury and, and, uh, Eddie Crouch, um, you know, amazing. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, you guys are all like the the super quads that I'm just like, well, if they're doing it, then you know what, what the hell's my excuse? Yeah. Well, you figure things out and you figure out what works for you and what works for other people may not necessarily work for you, but it's uh, you know trial and error. Look, I spent plenty of time on the floor. I spent plenty of time transferring or just you know, you know, it's research and development. And you figure out what's worse. And I've got it down now and have had it down for many years. But I'm going to tell a quick Eddie story. I hope he doesn't get mad at me about this one. This is so amazing. So we're at the tryout for the 96 Paralympic team. And Eddie had some issues one night at about midnight. And he was up all night, all night taking care of quad stuff. And All goes right. out the next day and still freaking kills it on the court. And he doesn't tell anybody because that's who Eddie is. He doesn't tell anybody. I find out later that he was all up all night. Something didn't agree with him. And dude didn't sleep. And he, he's a man child. That was, that was so amazing to me. I was thinking, if that was me, I would have done my best on the court the next day, of, of course. But he was still killing it. I was like, Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't know. I don't and know what it is line, about Eddie. And the bottom line, Tim, is he made the team, and I was an alternate. 
Uh, Eddie's just yeah. got this. He's I don't I don't know if it's like a if he's got like a chip on his shoulder or something, but he's just got this extra edge. Nah, I I, well, I love it. I mean, I I, freak, I freaking I, I love it. He's a chip, but I, I have seen I think what you're talking about. It's Maybe like I don't know. It's like may, maybe he's always just got that like edge. Like he's just got a he's got something to prove to himself or or something. But he's just he's just got that that X factor. I don't I don't know what it is, man. Right, 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 right. Um. So wait, so let's let's part, the other part of ahead. that story real quick to closure is that that year we were a demonstration sport at the Atlantic Atlanta um, Summer Paralympics, mm -hmm. and and that was right in my wheelhouse when I was probably playing my best rugby i made usa from 92 to 95 and 96 you know was my goal i wanted i wanted paralympics of course and we got the announcement i was in one of two really strong lineups we got the announcement the saturday of the tryout so we only had one more day and i believe we were trying out at we were at the olympic training facility in colorado but terry vineyard the coach comes in and says well, I got some bad news. We can only choose an eight-man team. They don't have enough bed space for us oh, man. in Atlanta because it's a demonstration sport. Yeah. And I looked at, I looked over at my friend Angelo Monjovi, three point five, also Hall of Famer, and I looked at him because he and I were in the second best lineup, and I looked over at him and we just kind of went, oh. Come on. Are you kidding me? And that was it. We ended up uh, both being alternates. Do you um do you remember what gym you guys were using when you're at uh cuz you yeah, were at the you were at the um, Olympic Training Center, right? Yeah, yeah. Do, I, you know, I'm not sure about that. Was it I'll tell you what I do remember. I remember the the cafeteria. Oh man, the food was so good. Yeah. Uh, it still is. I was there in uh, 2017 with Team US. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, they had a. Uh, I remember the food being just fabulous, and then uh, they had hot fudge Fridays, which was really a, a nice little treat. What is it? They call it hot fudge Fridays, where they just got okay. hot hot fudge for like ice cream. Oh, and gotcha. you could throw you know fudge on brownies. Wow. Yeah, it was good. It was a nice little treat. But yeah, now the. Uh, here's what I do remember, Tim. We had to push up a pretty damn substantial hill just to get to practice from where we were sleeping. Oh, and, okay. Uh, and it was snowing, too. I wonder where you guys were at. A couple of days, and I had to find somebody to give me a shove. Because now it's. um, We have. It's a pretty good hill to go up to the, the dorms. And then it's all downhill from there, uh, but you uh, got up from the gym to the cafeteria. It was uphill, and then from the cafeteria to the dorms, okay. it was uphill. I, you might be right. I just remember having to push up a hill at some point. Yeah, and our um, our like gym, gym was right by like the little alley of flags. Right. Yeah, that was a cool experience. Oh, it was an amazing experience, and and to be oh, and here's the other thing. <laughs> I can't believe I just remembered this. So they have like a wall of fame where you can sign that you've been there. Oh and yeah. Do you remember this? Do they still have it? Um, I don't remember signing my name on a wall or anything. All right. So it was right outside. Well, we weren't supposed to, we weren't supposed to unless we made it. And of course I took my Sharpie out <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I was just searching the wall and I found Carl Lewis and Edwin Moses, and I wrote my name right between them. Out of boy. Well, if I ever make it back there, I'm gonna go find this wall. I don't. I don't yeah. remember. And then the next day, and then the next day, didn't make the team. I don't really feel guilty about that, though. I'm okay with it. You might have jinxed yourself. Oh, oh, ouch. It's don't kind of it's kind of like those guys that go to boot like Marine boot camp with a uh, eagle globe and anchor tattoo, well, and then and then they. Break right. their leg okay. and, well, and don't in, make the in cut. my defense here, we didn't find out that it wasn't okay. A lot of us did it. We didn't find out that it wasn't okay unless you're on the team until the next day. But you're right. Maybe there was a jinx. Man. Let's uh let's bring it back a little bit though. Um 
how did you find out about wheelchair rugby anyways? Okay. So this, yeah, this is, is, I'm trying to write a book and this is one of the first chapters. Oh, Um, you could use this as a resource. Yeah. So, okay. So I had gone on a river rafting trip with the Bay area outreach program. Uh, the acronym is, acronym is BORP, B-O-R-P. Mm-hmm. And um, I met a couple of people on this thing. And this would have been like 1984. I was in, yeah, I was in summer school at Cal. And so I go on this river rafting thing and I'm, this I'm was, not a big this water This was just, anyway. this was just organized through the school? Yeah, uh, the school. Well, it was on campus there. They're no longer with the school, uh, but they were with UC Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were on campus there and I had heard about it. So I went to check it out. And, and that's also where I first found out about lightweight, um, chairs and got one, a quickie one. But anyway, um, I met a few people there, including one woman named Bonnie Lukowitz and Bonnie remembered me four years later. And she had been at, she was a, um, track and field athlete. And really good, actually, too. And she was also a .5 in rugby. Um, but she had remembered me and remembered I was the guy that got injured playing rugby. And she was trying to put a rugby team together because she had just seen it at a demonstration at the National Wheelchair Games, I believe, in Houston. And she had seen a demo down there. And um, so she was very diligent. Again, no computers. She had no Internet. So this was 88 she looked me up in phone books and you know, there's a lot of Chris cooks in there and she (laughs) said she dialed like seven of them and finally got me. And she opened up with, are you the Chris cook that got injured playing rugby? And I went, who is this? (laughs) And she said, well, you may or may not know me, but blah, blah, blah. And she told me all about it. And I said, my first question was, how do you play rugby in a wheelchair? I mean, does the grass slow you down? Yeah. (laughs) No, no, no. We play on a basketball court. I was like, oh, all right. So she invited me. I showed up and it was about eight or 10 of us. Um, Half of the people there were women and including a woman coach. And I looked around. I went, this is fun. This is really fun. And we were in our everyday chairs just out there, you know, cutting and banging and ridiculous. And I, I came home with uh, a toenail that was an issue because of getting hit by somebody. And I got my toenail mended and I, I was in, I was totally in. It was great. What, uh, what made you, uh, fall in love? Um, well, I've always been a team sport guy and I was yearning for a sport. Basketball wasn't working for me, obviously. I tried swimming, I tried track, I tried field events, I tried table tennis. None of those are team sports. And um, I even tried power soccer. I don't know, it just wasn't a good fit. There's no workout in power soccer. And so um, here's this sport where I could push and get a good burn in. And it was strategic and it was, you know, there was impact, there was physical contact. Um, It it was everything. So. I mean, it was an easy fit for me. Cause like, what were you doing in between all this? Like, how were you, were you um, still working out, like pushing around the block or what was going yeah, on? Were you playing basketball? Uh, no, very little cardio actually, except um, while I was in school, actually, we had a track indoors that was level and I would push up there. And I actually used to put one or two pound hand weights on my wrists. Oh, nice. Push with them. And I was working out pretty regularly. Um, I had a gymnastics um, guy that turned me on to these cuffs that you slide your fingers in. I'm not even sure which gymnastics events they're for, but um, he gave me a pair and I adapted them and suddenly I could grip weights. I could grip hand weights or use um, a universal weight machine. That kind of changed my whole world. And so I was still able to get a good workout in but I didn't have any sports. So that was, yeah, it was a big deal for me. 
Yeah, it's a uh, it's a lot different when you're when you're just working out just to work out. But when you have a right when you got a sport in front of you and something that like you know you're putting the the pieces together. Like I need to lift this weight so that I can right. throw the ball further, or you know like right, I, right. I need to build my biceps up so I can push my chair. Right. You know, I got I got uh, some other info here sort of like advice for low pointers uh, or maybe mid pointers or whoever. Anyway, if you feel like you're, you're, you're burning your shoulders or you're going to have shoulder problems, et cetera, et cetera, stop lifting heavy weights. Um, I don't think in the last 25 years I've lifted more than five pounds on, on either hand, uh, maybe military press, maybe that one a little bit more, but just staying in your chair, and doing a set number of reps. Um, I got this from a guy who was a Greco-Roman wrestler and a bronze medalist in the 1964 Olympics. And he was my coach at this junior college near my mom's house. And he taught me how to work out and how to not waste your shoulders. And here I am nearly 60 and it's, it's worked for me. I'm not gonna say it's gonna work for everybody. But you just um, you do lots and lots and lots of reps with very very little weight, and um, it's sort of like almost like cardio, but it's not. Now I have a hand cycle and a Vita Glide as well. But and what was uh, that? Like? Oh, a uh, Vera Glide or whatever. I'm sorry again. What was that last one? A Vera Glide. Oh, a Vita Glide. Vita Glide. You familiar with it? I think I know what you're talking about. That's like the thing that's got like the two tri pins. Yeah, it's a core thing. Um, Lori turned me on to it. And um, I actually bought mine used from Lee Mercado. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, I am. Um, basically... Go ahead. Go ahead. I, um, I don't really uh, lift that much anymore either. Um, I've been doing a. Well, I guess let's go back to what we've been doing during our, our lockdown. I've been working out a lot, um, but I've been doing mostly like the indoor rower. And um, mm-hmm. uh, I got these uh, new, they're called split ropes. And they're they're like, okay. it's like a jump rope, but it's um, it's gotcha. split in half, right? Um, and it's it's made for uh, wheelchair users. And that, that actually gets the, okay, the wait, shoulders. Do you do both of these in your chair or do you get out of your chair? Uh, do it both for my, for my everyday. Yeah. See that that's something I'm look, I don't have enough function and don't want to waste my time transferring in and out of things, at least, especially if they're not my height. Yeah. Um, agreed. <laughs> if I can find something to stay in my chair. I'll, yeah. I'll try any of that. The, uh, the split ropes weren't bad. Um, they're made by a company called mute sports equipment. And, um, you know, uh, they make one with a, it's like a grip assist. It's like a cheap piece of Velcro that kind of goes over the top. Uh, I've actually been using right. mine with uh, my active hands, which are just like these Velcro cuffs that um, I also use for my, my rower, uh, my indoor rower. Um, but the, um, the split ropes are great. Like I do um, every morning, I do uh, five rounds of Three, three minutes each with a minute rest in between. So the whole thing takes, you know, 20 minutes. Um, but yeah, man, it's a, it's a good workout. Um, that sounds cool. Yeah. That's one thing that I'm, I'm probably going to keep doing. Um, and then, uh, I, I just bought a speed bag cause I've always, I've always wanted a, a speed bag that was, you know, wheelchair height. You said a pee bag, a speed, a speed bag. bag. What is it? A speed bag, like in boxing. A boxing oh, gotcha. speed bag. Yeah, I've always wanted one, just gotcha. you know, wheelchair height. So that's cool. Yeah, I'm probably gonna. Uh-huh. Um, I actually just got uh, the go ahead. I'm gonna section off like a twenty by twenty um, square foot uh, section in my pole barn for all this equipment, um, just because the house mm-hmm. is starting to get full. But um, hey Tim. Yep. Hey Tim. Yep. Are you able to edit this at all? Yeah. Okay, can we take a break? My uh, my mom's caregivers are doing a shift break, and I have to—I uh, mean, a shift change—and I, I have to go in and, and do a couple things. But 
or is there more you want to do? Yeah, yeah. There's um, actually okay. that's a good time because I got to go take a piss too. Okay. Why don't we take a half hour break and I'll be back with you. We left off. Uh, we were just talking about wheelchair rugby, um, but for those that don't know or don't have any like quote unquote old timers on their team. Sure. What were, what, what's like the biggest difference between rugby now and rugby um, back then when you were um, starting out? Uh, there's so many changes. Um, I'll touch on a few. Well, okay. Uh, how, how, okay. Uh, well, before we get into that, how many teams were there in the league? Okay. When I started, there were eight teams in the United States. And three of those Southern California, and we were the only team in Northern California, and there were only four more teams in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it was quite small. And what did uh, uh, what did the international picture look like? Yeah. So okay. So, um, well, I started playing in '88, and we went to nationals that year, and we took third out of. I think that year, we had 12 teams there. Um, the first year I played, there were only eight teams. Well, no, the first year when I found out about it, I wasn't playing yet. There were only eight teams at Nationals in 87, and it grew fast after that. Um, I'm sure you guys all know the, the history of it, but started in Manitoba, Canada, came down to North Dakota, Grand Forks, Brad Mickelson, former commissioner, the quad father of the United States. And then Minnesota probably had the best team in the United States at that time. Well, now we're talking like 1982. And it didn't really get any growth, though, until guys from track and field and other quads started finding out about it. And they're like, whoa, this is totally different. Yeah. And how I found out about it in 80. Seven or 88, Bonnie Lukowitz, as I mentioned before, brought it back to the Bay Area. And the Bay Area Outreach Program, you know, got us a gym and we started. So that first year, summer of 88, that phone call, it, it changed my life. It changed everything for me. And I was done with college. I was working part-time at a law firm and thought I wanted to be a lawyer and um, didn't follow that path. But that's another story. But anyway, um, so in the early days, we would practice twice a week, like Tuesdays, no, no, Thursdays and Saturdays. And we had guys, one particular, um, Alan Seals from Reno, driving from Reno to the Bay. So it's, you know, three and a half, four hours. Twice and a week? Depending on where. What's that? Twice a week he would do this? No, he would drive in. Um, I had a, a house in Richmond, California, that's uh, in the East Bay, kind of near Oakland, Berkeley. Um, has kind of a bad rep for, you know, crime and so forth, but I lived in a good area. Al would drive down on Thursday, and then, and he's a teacher too, um, drive down on Thursday, and then practice right away. Thursday, I think we went from like six to nine. And then spend the night, Thursday night and Friday night, and then practice with us Saturday from noon to three, and drive back home. Oh wow, that's commitment. Went on. This went on for three years. He did this. Stand on my couch. And um, and by the way, he started the Hall of Fame. He uh, he's not in it, but he started it, and it was his idea and et cetera. And you know, he needs to get credit for that. Um, okay, so in the early days, we're all in our everyday chairs, basically. And what I used to do, <laughs> imagine this. Okay, you got your brakes on your everyday chair. I would have somebody take out an Allen wrench and just turn my brakes underneath the chair. Yeah. Then I would take wheels that I had, um, taken um, surgical tubing and wrapped it around the push rooms all the way so I had grip. I was playing without gloves. You talking about like that tubing. that like orange colored tubing? Yes, exactly. Surgical tubing. And so I'd wrap my wheels. I wish I had pictures of that. It's a crack up. And then we kinda of realized, oh, you know, 
these things turn better if you have some camber. So then I got another whole chair just to use for rugby, mm -hmm. another everyday chair. I put washers in the, in, the, uh, in the plates so that I could get enough camber. It probably had like, I don't know, eight degrees maybe. And so, you know, I'm still sitting. Which, is a, which is a lot for an everyday chair. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's the point. I had to have a second chair because it wouldn't go through the doorways anymore. It yeah. couldn't get in the bathrooms. So, um, so I ended up uh, using that for another year. And um, things are starting to catch on. Now, at this point, 1990, there's 42 teams in the country. So maybe, wow, maybe it grew that third. quick. So it just grew exponentially. But you know what? And, um, it was probably a good blessing that, you know, you didn't have any, like, specialized equipment and that you were just able to kind of convert your everyday chair into something that just would work for the time yeah, being. Sure. For sure. Yeah. And so my first team was the uh, Berkeley Quadzillas and um, we, um, we were around from 88 till 96. Um, and we climbed all the way to the top. We won nationals once we were in the finals. So four, four years in a row. Lost once to Minnesota, the team I was telling you about, mm -hmm. and two other times to Tampa. It's, you know, Joe Soros and Goldie and Terry Vinder was the coach, and um, they were they were good, really good. Yeah. And, but so were we. It was often it was them and us, and then everybody else was a step below. So I know and, I uh, know Tampa's been around for the longest time. Are any of those teams uh, from from when you started playing? Are are any of them still around? Yeah, um, he's still around. Let me think about this. Because, like, isn't C Connecticut's a pretty old school team, right? Yeah, the Jammers. Yeah, they're around. Um, not really, man. Most of them from back in those days, they're gone. They're all gone. I mean, they might be different teams from the same city. Yeah, but they're different, different sponsors, different, different franchise, different, personnel. different franchise. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so. So, as you can imagine, you know, let, let's talk just a bit about Canada, USA, um, before I get into classifications and chairs. So, Canada used to just whoop the you-know-what out of every USA team. They were better. They knew more about the game. They, you know, it started there in 77. And they took great pride in kicking our asses every time they could. And, and I mean, no mercy. Just if we can throw a 50 spot on you, and that means nobody was even pressing yet. I mean, and there's no shot clock. If they could throw a 50 spot on us, they would. And so there was one team in particular that was, I think, unbeaten. I want to say for five years, they were unbeaten. Wow. And that was Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, and, you said? And we're talking, what's that? You said Saskatchewan? Saskatchewan, yeah. I think they called themselves the... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. Well, they had to have been the Sasquatches. Yeah, but they had another name, too. Anyway, they, had, they ran a four-deuce lineup. Well, when the classification system changed, those four deuces, two of them were actually 3.5. <laughs> All right? So you do the math. So anyway... The other two actually were deuces, and they used to whoop us. They used to whoop us good. So what's that, 11 points? <laughs> what's that? That's 11 points. They were running three over. Yes, exactly. And so um, as we got better, um, we actually had a chance to take them down at the Andy Beck tournament in Dallas. They were down there, you know, and they were, they were pretty arrogant. But they were, they were very good. They were the deal. They were the team to beat. And um, I remember uh, we had tied the game with like 40 seconds to go. And we were just going to run the clock. And uh, they weren't pressing us. They, they had faith in their half-court deep. No, they were pressing us. They came out. They came out to press us when they realized we were just going to run the clock down. And I'm not going to name names here, but somebody made an inadvisable pass behind his back. Ooh. 
and it went out of bounds. And suddenly they had the ball, and the game was tied. Uh, and they, they won the game in the last second, and we <laughs> lost. And it was, it was like, that to me, that was bigger than winning or losing nationals. Losing to that team in that time, that would have been epic. That would have been like beating the Patriots when they were 18-0 and 0 in the Super Bowl. That's how big it was. Yeah. It didn't happen. Those, uh, you always remember those losses. It doesn't, oh, yeah. ma- it doesn't matter how many. It doesn't matter how many years. You always remember those those losses now, that you're just like you had it in the bag and it. Absolutely, you know, Tim. I haven't told that story in years, and I'm all fired up right now. It's like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys, uh, if you guys did a reunion and ran it back, who do you think would win? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So okay, so. I'd say the biggest change, though, two changes, were the classification system and chairs. When, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take a little credit here. The first picker ever was invented simply to protect my feet from getting hammered. Yeah, um, and that's I, like because you're like a size like 14 or something, right? I have a 14 too. Yeah. Six foot, well, I'm probably 5'11 now. I have a big foot. So anyway, I was I told you like my first practice, my I basically lost my big toenail. Mm-hmm. Never grew back properly. But ever since then, I you know, my dad was an engineer and I came home and he had he was a welder and he had everything. And so I said, Dad, I need something to protect protect my feet. So he came up with this. You know how everyday chairs have the little the round little foot holder and your feet stick out? got two bars and your feet basically lay across them yep so we took another one of those and welded it to the front of the existing one on my chair oh, okay. so it looked like a football face mask yeah yeah okay? like an old school like just the one the, the face mask with the one bar running across the mouth well, it, was, it was two bars two bars because we had it you know it was vertical going that direction to protect my feet yeah, so yeah. vertical up and down where my feet laid on it and horizontal across the front. And oh. that was, dude, that was it. It, it, it worked. It protect my feet. But the next thing I found out about was if I could get that thing in front of a guy's caster wheel or in front of his um, rear wheel, I could hold him for a split second. Yeah. And it couldn't go anywhere. And that's how the picker was born. And then came the wings. The wings. Oh, and also, before that, like, like raised spoke guards. So we didn't have those either yet. We were using old basketball spoke guards that just protected the spokes, but they weren't um, flush against your push rim, so people could still get in there. Mm-hmm. Well, Al Seals and Nils Jorgensen basically took a garbage can lid and zip-tied it to their spokes, and that's how that was born. Oh wow! So, so the first metal spoke guard was actually just a trash can lid. Yep, a trash can lid that we uh, made sure had enough width to fit right inside of your push rim, and then we also were attaching the push rims right up flush against the wheel. That's how that was born. Now I don't know, I don't know who invented the wings, but they came shortly after that. Yeah. And then it and then it just became like an arms race, right? Of just right, like it was every year. And let's give credit where credit's due. So Chris Peterson at Top End, he saw what I was doing with my with my front end, and he goes, "Can I can I work with you on that?" And I was, "Yes, absolutely." And I and I said, "Do I get royalties?" And he goes, "No, because nobody, you know, they just change one little thing, mm-hmm. and you can't really like copyright that." I was like, okay, I get it. That's what? Right, but a uh, patent. So anyway. What uh? What were some? What company. were some of the? Wait, hold, hold, what were some of the craziest things that you would see people showing up and just trying out? All right. Well, I was going to give some credit here first. Um, Peterson and uh, Bear Ewing at Eagle, and um, a little bit later, Mike Box, and um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some people here. But they were all involved in this, quote, arms race. Um, also, the shadow 
uh, quickie people, and it was basically top end and quickie at the at the beginning, and and uh, and eagle, and then after that, um, Melrose of course came along, and then of course. Oh, I didn't know I didn't know Melrose was that old. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, and by the way, Chris Peterson called the first um, picker that he built for me. He called it the Cook Hook, and okay. it was around for about two, three years. And then everybody, everybody just you know went from there and, and took over. Okay, the craziest thing I've seen, and it was it was lethal, was the front end was pointed like a missile. <laughs> and it had two caster wheels that basically looked like roller skate, and they were like maybe about two or three inches apart. And that was Eagle. Barry Ewing did that. Yeah. And I believe I'm going to get called out on this one. I believe Sean Merritt's team. I want to say Norm Lydic had one, and a few. Oh, Bill Renji had one. And a few others um, when they were up at University of Illinois, and that lasted about two tournaments. Everybody said, "No, no, no, <laughs> that is so, that's not cool." Um, you would take that front end, take that front end, and just stick it in between the big wheel and the caster, and nobody was going anywhere. Yeah. Who, um, like, so was it just a was it a a like a committee of players that would decide what was allowed and what wasn't allowed or like what kind of organization uh, was there at this point? You know, it was the AGM and they had a a competition committee of sorts. And, um, but I'll say this from about 89 to 94, it was a free for all. Everybody was doing everything. It was like, you know, that was, it was, it was was like, it was like world war one. It was like chemical warfare and, and yeah. anything goes. Well, I was gonna say, yes, I was going to say it's like craft beer. Everybody had to have their own. Okay. And but anyway, it was it was interesting. Here's the bad news: if you didn't have any money or a sponsor, every year you had to get something new, and it was tough for people. And finally, they just came up with the rules that we pretty much have had for the last maybe 20 years. No, not quite. Yeah, probably 20 years. Since by the mid to late nineties, all chairs were starting to look the same. Yeah. Do you remember the transition? Because you, you had mentioned um, rollerblade casters. Do you do you remember the transition from when you guys started to first start using like rollerblade wheels? Because I would imagine if you were using your everyday chairs, it was all yeah, you know, five inch um, rubber casters. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Here's um, my recollection is people that came in from tennis sort of brought that with them because they were already using them. Okay. Um, but there were, there were track guys and tennis guys and field event guys. Bas- and, basketball. You know, and basketball. Some of the quads, the, the, the high pointers we know of, they were playing basketball. Mm-hmm. So they were also using rollerblade wheels, I believe. Kind of like, uh, kind of like things now. Like there's a lot of, um, basketball amputees that are, you know, finding out like, oh, I can, I can class in. Right. So since we've been, I call it in search of function. Yeah. I mean, that's essentially it. Well, it's the new, uh, in my opinion, it's kind of the new arms race, you know, like I I would imagine back in the nineties, it was finding the best equipment. Now it's trying to find the most functional guys. Well, you know, also Tim, this lends to, the theory, I mean, back in the day, I think the best lineups out there were four really high-functioning deuces. Mm-hmm. But once you found, you know, quote, your freak, I'm going to throw some names at you. You know, back in the day, uh, most of the freaks were either polio or perhaps, you know, like Steve Pate, Guillaume Barre, Angela Monjovi, um, polio, Joe Soros, polio. Those, those were the best of the high pointers because they had the most function and they were also great athletes. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, now if you find a guy, um, Corey, for instance, if you find a guy, whether he's had a lot of sports experience or not, if he's got that function, you want to train him. 
you want to work with them. And, you know, some of these guys have become the very best athletes we have. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting because, like, if this sport didn't exist, there wouldn't be anything. I don't think there'd be anything really out there for those type of players um, right. to really excel at. I mean, we're talking best in the world, you know. You know, we've also seen the evolution of, well, you may or may not know about this, but back in the day in like the early 90s, I would say there was a group of people that wanted to make quad rugby, spinal cord injury only. It, thank God it got voted down. I always thought that was ridiculous. But um, some people were just seeing their roles disappear because of... Uh, who had either more function or better cardio or, you know, all of the above. And um, I mean, even back in those days, our best, our best player with Quadzilla at the time was Brian Hansen. And he was a three, five, he was a walking spinal cord, but he had limitations because he was slow. And a one, when the chairs changed, he left. I mean, he, he couldn't compete anymore because he couldn't get off of a one or two or a 0.5 and a one, they could just hold him all day. He couldn't hop really. And he was stuck. And, but in our day, he was the best. He was a great passer, a great ball handler. No one was pressing yet. And he could play the middle like nobody. He could just pick the ball up out of the air. Cause he had one really good hand. Yeah. And yet it, it all changed, man. The evolution had all changed. There's um. There's a lot of players that are playing today where I'm just like, man, you are just one generation too late. Cause if you were, if yeah. you were in this game 15 right? years ago, man, you'd be a fucking superstar. Okay. For example, for example, you would know this better than me. When's the last time we had a really, really dominant, strong high pointer who's spinal cord on team us. Sure. Um, well, I mean, the last one I would say would be uh, Chance Sumner. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I mean, Wheeler's Wheeler's a two five, you know, and and he's kind of in that weird anomaly. I mean, he is a spinal cord, but he's got just enough function here, you know, to make him a, a really effective two five. Um, but as far as a, a true High pointer in in the three three point five class. I mean, the, the last one was Chance. Um, I guess Zupan Zupan was up there. Yeah. Um, and he hasn't made you for what five years? Zupan or no, not Zup. Uh, Chance. Chance. Uh, Chance's last year, I think, was two thousand twelve. He was he was on the yeah, two thousand twelve so team. I'm trying to think if he continued on after yeah. that. And Zup- Year was what? Oh four, oh five. What's? Or did he play? No, he played in 08, didn't he? Uh, I'm not sure. That was that was before my time. I know uh, Zupan was still on in, during during that time. Well, here's one I'll, here's one I'll throw at you. Um, pound for pound, if you can find and clone four Nick Springers, or maybe three. And one guy with hands and arms that can throw the ball accurately and decently. Um, that I'll take that team everywhere. As long as they're in shape and they can cut like Nick could. Holy moly! Yeah, Nick could. Nick was one of the few guys I thought that could cover Riley Bat, and he's a deuce. Yeah, that's um, you know, that's one of the big debates is because you know, in my opinion or at least since I've been playing, my USA Dream Team would be that four-deuce lineup from Beijing. Um, but I don't, I don't know how they would stack up against uh, the teams today. Like, I don't, know, I don't know if they would be able yeah. to beat Japan yeah. or Australia. That's a good point. Things have changed again. Which, so I mean... Just, hey, on, our podcast, on our podcast, we just interviewed Gumby, and he, he made a point that is, is so true, and that is that Chuck Aoki... Um, 
has reinvented itself a few times now. And I hadn't really given it that much thought, but Chuck's been with the squad now 10 years, I think, or nine years, something like that. And, uh, I mean, let's face it, he's still a dominant 3-5. And, um, He's a, you know, he's I, a three I, internationally. And he's not particularly big. He's just really good at whatever he does. Yeah, he's a he's a three internationally. But, um, you know, one thing that Chuck doesn't really get a lot of credit for is um, his brain power. I mean, the guy's a really smart guy. Oh, for sure. Um, I, and I think a lot of that is just because he – it looks like he plays a real physical game. But um, – you know, he doesn't. I don't think he really gets a lot of credit for being as cerebral as he as he is. Well, then people aren't paying attention. He's one of the smartest guys out there for sure. Yeah. He's also he's also a history guy. I, I love to talk history. So anyway, um, um, I was going to say something else. Oh, I want to get back to the classification system. So when it changed back in the day, it was three, two, one. Simply that, three, two, and one. So your lineups were three, two, two, one, or three, three, one, one, or two, 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 two. That's it. That's all you can run. And uh, when that changed, you know, it went from 0.5 to 3.5. Now you've got seven different classifications. Everything changed. And it's, I believe, very different then than it is now. The first, um, I'll give you an example of the first. Um, classification system I'm probably going to blow this but it was Anne-Marie Glenn and Diane Bulger and possibly a couple other people that wrote it and we all got reclassed at Best of the West San Diego it was the November tournament of 1990 90. and I had been playing two years as a one and um, I really didn't think it was fair there were plenty of ones out there that just they owned me. I, you know, I, I had way less function than, than most. And so I thought there was a possibility that I could go down, but I really didn't know. Yeah. And we're in this line in the hotel. I think a nervous line because some people that are threes are worried they're going to get classed out. And others are just worried they're going to get classed up and there goes their playing time. And now they had a whole, um, a whole speculation, uh, I'm sorry, stipulation for, for a trunk function. Before that, trunk didn't matter. For instance, a guy named Dom Clemens from Minnesota was a class one. When it was all said and done, they made him a two. And that's the guy I had to guard forever because we were playing man to man, which is stupid now. But was this going, um, this was like international, right? Like they were going to um, half point system? Yeah, no, that, that started here in the U.S. Oh, okay. And then International adopted it? Yeah, we went International with the half-point system. Within a year, everybody adopted it. Okay. And also, also there was a big movement at that time at Nationals in 90 um, to make it eight and a half points to include at least one of your guys that got bumped up. So oh, okay. they got voted down, and so it stayed at eight. But anyway... Um, I'm in that line, and Nils is right behind me. Nils, you know, all, all world class two, all world track athlete who was not beaten in his his track classification for something like four or seven years in sprint. He just owned it, owned everybody. Wow. And so he and I are teammates and housemates, and we're talking, and he's telling me, I'm not going up. I don't have a trunk. I don't have this. I don't have that. I'm like, are you sure? I said, you're strong as hell. He goes, nope, it's about what you have functionally, and I don't have it. And he goes, and I think you're going down. And I'm like, really? So I'm, I'm kind of, and I went in first, and people are coming out of that room, Tim, and they got tears in their eyes, like, fuck, I'm done. <laughs> and I go in, and they spent a half hour with me. I Okay, Tim, this, this will hit home for you. I was you 20 years before you. Okay. Yeah, I know exactly I what that, you mean. I was that tweener in the room. They couldn't figure out. And so, as you probably well know, you have much more function than I do. But the thing, things have changed. Back then, finally, Anne-Marie looks at me 
And she goes, Chris, I can't quite figure it out how you do what you do. I think you're a 0.75. And I went, okay, what does that mean? And Diane says to me, she goes, well, we're going to watch you on the court before we put a label on you. Is that okay? Because we think you're right in between. I went, okay, I'm fine with that. So now I'm thinking, do I hold back? No, it's probably not a good idea, blah, blah, blah. But at least I got to play initially as a 0.5. And Emily says to me, she goes, she goes, what do you think you are? And I went, really? You're asking me? I said, well, I'm a 0.5. And I explained that to them because they knew the people I was comparing myself to who were definitely ones and definitely had more function than me. And it worked. I've been a 0.5 ever since. Right on. So you're like one of the one of the OG point fives. Right. Yeah, it's weird because the um, classification system. I mean, I think uh, if we're going to be including the triple amps that have been kind of sneaking their way into the sport, it's uh, we're going to have to do something to kind of decompress everything because it. You know, there's there's guys that are like C eight quads that are getting classed out. But they're letting yeah, right. You know, guys with one perfect hand um, in. And it's like, man, we got to do something to kind of decompress a, the a, system. I have a potential solution, but most people don't want to hear it. Yeah, um, what's that? Just, um, all the quad amps who you believe are borderline, um, make them fours and still allow eight points, and you can have a four, but it has to be. It's a non-spinal cord thing. It has to be a four because they have probably both complete shoulders, one or two complete arms or hands. No, not, not more than one complete hand. But you get the point. If you did that and still made it eight points, that would level the playing ground, I think. Yeah, that was uh, kind of my solution was uh, you just got to add a four class, and I, I would even be open to um, adding a zero class. Okay. Yeah, just a straight up zero well, we class. Have that because of age, but well, what do you mean? well, I mean, internationally, you can only achieve that if you're a point five uh, female. Oh, I see. And I you've been you. you've been yeah, seeing yeah, yeah, that yeah. a lot more and more. Is like people yeah, yeah. countries countries are actively seeking zero class females. Um, you know, Japan's got one. The U.S. has one. Um, and Canada. that's that's kind of a uh, the um, I don't know what you would call that. Like a, se- I guess a secret it's weapon. It's like a, it's like a secret weapon. It's, it's, in, it's it's inclusion and it's an equalizer. Right, right. But there are guys that have you know zero tricep, zero wrist flexion and extension. So they just got a completely floppy right. wrist, you know. And um, right, right. having that wrist is kind of a kind of a big deal it changes the way you you're able to push your your wheels the way you have to glove up and um so you know i just had uh, had matt lewis living here for uh, uh, almost two months on and off and um what you know great dude and i'm not saying he's illegal or a four i'm not going to make those decisions however when you when you are living with someone or you're around them enough, maybe in a hotel room, or what have you, um, you see stuff and you go, damn, <laughs> he can get out of that chair in a heartbeat. Yeah. You know, and he's got no legs, and he just can, like, do a little um, a dip and swing his whole body over into another chair or onto the couch or whatever. Yeah. I know you're talking. I mean, I had I had Roscoe. I had Roscoe from Columbia with me for a while. Oh, there you go. So I know exactly how that is. So, so when but you see that stuff, and you go, oh yeah, and they play the same game on the same court as we do. Right. <laughs> um, a real a real eye opener back in the day when we were doing the classification change. A real eye opener for me was. I had a buddy, I'm not going to name any names, but I had a buddy that was from another team who stayed over at my house because we were going to go to a concert that night. 
and it was too far of a drive, et cetera, to go home. So um, I said, dude, all I've, all I've got is a couch. And he's a low pointer at the time. He was a one, just like me. And so he uh, comes over, and I said, um, I have an attendant that's coming in in about 30 minutes. She can help you get on the couch. And he goes, oh, I got it. I was like, really? And this couch was quite a bit lower. I said, how are you going to get out in the morning? And he goes, oh, I got that too. And I looked at it and I said, and we're the same classification. <laughs> That's not fair. Because <laughs> this couch was about eight inches lower, I'd say six to eight inches lower than my chair level. And if I got on it, I could get on it probably, but there'd be no way in hell I could get off of it. And I just looked at him and went, ah, it's not fair. And then the <laughs> classification change came and it made everything fair. Couches, well, couches, fair. couches can be tricky. I've, uh, I've looked at a few couches where it's like, oh, I should be able to get off of that. And then, you know, I transfer in and then I find, you know, oh, the cushion really sinks in. And now, like, I got a 10-inch hop up. Um, in the So, actually, um, bringing it back to rugby, when you and I really started getting to know each other was uh, in 2000. 12 when i moved to vegas um exactly. and uh you were kind of transitioning from uh i mean full-time player to kind of part-time coach yeah uh how was how was that transition hated it yeah uh well yeah um Okay, when I was with the Skulls the year before, all that changed. No, two years before, because then I went to Sacramento for a year. Um, I was still a full-time player. I actually, Tim, I retired in 04 because my of that car accident I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And then I got acupuncture and things were better. And at that time, okay, that's when the rule passed about 45 and older. So I went from a 0.5 to a zero. And suddenly I was looking around going, wow, this is a little bit of a game changer for me. And so I got back in shape and wanted to play and I had no team. Um, the Quake team had kind of dissolved at that time. They had made nationals that didn't go. Suddenly they didn't have a team. I talked to Ed Olson. They didn't really have anything going on. And then we did a kind of a, I don't know if it was a fundraiser or it was some sort of an event and the Vegas guys came and they and I, I clicked with those guys, you know, it was shock and, and Eric and Sean and all of them. They're just Brandon, et cetera. Anyway, um, I said, Hey, I don't have a team right now with 150 miles of me. Um, can I, can I play with you guys in Vegas? And they're like, yeah, that'd be great. I'm like, cool. So that's how I got into that. And of course, Quake came back like the next year, but I was already in. So I didn't have to go play with them because, you know, we didn't have a team. Anyway, um, so in Vegas, we had Brad Orham. He was our coach and he did a great job. Um, but he had very little experience with wheelchair sports. So I was kind of helping out on the court at least, but in huddles and game planning and all that, it was a group effort. Um, but honestly, Tim, I didn't want to be a coach. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to just keep playing. Um, I'd always been, you know, kind of either a captain or making some of those decisions, but I never was the coach. And now suddenly I'm thrust into it. And um, I fought it for a while. I fought it. And then when we started doing our thing with the, uh, with the Renegades in, in Vegas, yeah. um, it was pretty clear that my value was much higher on the sideline than it was on the court. And it wasn't easy for me, though. I wanted to play still. Yeah. So it, I remember we, we, went to and, a couple, we went to a couple tournaments where we were able to get you in. Yeah, I know. But again, we didn't have a three five. Um, we brought in what we brought in Leon. He was a three. 
Um, can't remember who else right now. Oh, we brought in Garrett. Oh no, that was with. No, no, no. That was uh, that was the year before yeah. the Renegades. Yeah, 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 yeah. I played a lot that year. That was so much fun. But anyway, Garrett, Garrett, he's a savant. That guy, he knows. He he can man a few words, but when he talks, you listen. Uh, yeah. He's oh, tell for you sure. I uh I want to get him on the podcast. I just don't know how. I don't know if he'd be one. I don't know if he'd be up for it. But uh, yeah, of course. I know <laughs> he would have some great stories. Him and Willsey. Yeah. 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 Um, Garrett. Okay, I played with Garrett also in San Jose, way back, like in ninety eight ish, ninety nine, and I was a point five. I was still under forty five, obviously. And he was a 3-5, so we were in many lineups together. Yeah. In fact, we had a lineup, you'll love this one. It was Troy McCurk and Garrett and myself and a guy named Steve Davis played he was our, our one. And we got all the way to we got all the way to the semifinals in D1 um, back then. I don't know here, like 01 or 02. That's with, that's with an all-spinal cord team right there. It was, it was so much fun. We, we we didn't even we didn't even press that much. We we stayed in the key because Garrett and Troy were they were fucking amazing and and Steve and I played the corners and we inbound I believe I was the inbounder and we throw a pick or two just go like that and get in our corners because those guys took care of business. Right on. Um. Yeah. But anyway, but anyway, back to the coaching thing. At some point. I had to make a conscious decision that this is my role. And I started studying. I started reading coaching books. Um, the one that I read that had the most effect on me was John Wooden's book. Um, it's fantastic. Highly recommend it for anybody, athlete or non-athlete, coach, non-coach. It's just, it's a life book. I've John heard, I've heard that. Yeah, it's great. I actually have it. I have it on Disc. I'll loan it to you if you want. You can just pull it up. It's pretty expensive, though. But anyway, um, so I made a conscious decision to become a coach. And I'll, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't very good at first. I don't think I was very good at all. I um, probably, my X's and O's, they probably sucked. I knew how to motivate people, but that was about it. And I think I got better, but I don't know. I don't know, man. I, I think it's. It's, it's, it's a hard job, and, and honestly, there's not many out there that can both coach and play at the same time. Scott does it. Scott does it well, Scott Hogsett. Um, but I tried to do it. It's, it's nearly impossible. Yeah. It's nearly impossible to keep your objectivity and do everything and then keep your team happy, too. And That's a tough one. You know, it's, it, it's hard. And I, I like coaching, but I'm still passionate about the game. You know, I'm 32 years into rugby now. Amazing. 32 years into rugby, and it's still, I, I go to sleep thinking about it. And, um, and, and I'll say one more thing about that, and that is that when you are coaching, your job is never done. At night, off the court, whatever, you still work to be done. And because you're not getting the burn during the day of playing two games or what have you, you're not sleepy enough, so you lose sleep over it at night. At least I do. And I wake up in the morning and go, God damn, I wish I had two more hours of sleep. Yeah. And I wish I could have written down all the thoughts I had last night, but I was already in bed, et cetera. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had conversations with uh, Coach Gumby where I just tell him, man, like, dude, I do not envy your job one bit because you know when we're at camps he's not getting any sleep like i might be able to complain because you know i got like four hours of sleep because i had to get up early to do my bowel program or whatever but i know the the coaching staff is they would kill for four hours um yep so yeah it's 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 a tough gig it's really understated how how much it actually probably really sucks. Um, but, you know, there are rewards to it. Um, 
What, um, when, uh, cause, uh, you were the assistant coach when I was on team force, uh, what made you want to get involved with that? Um, and, and yeah, actually okay. for, can you explain what team force is for those yeah. that don't know? First of all, I'm going to preface this by saying it's a absolute shame that program doesn't exist anymore because it's our lifeblood. And um, I wish things weren't all about money as they all are. Yeah, hold up. Um, what are you doing back there? Because I'm getting a lot of like background noise. Yeah. So here's what happened. I've known Dave Cerruti forever. We played on Team USA in 94 and 95 together. And... Um, you probably don't know that much about him as a player, but he was a damn good one. He had a sweet inbound pass. Probably, you know, like nowadays, you probably look at Butler or somebody like that and go, wow, great inbound pass. That was Rudy as a class one 25 years ago. Okay. Uh, and even better, even better, more accurate, um, longer distance. And I recently had a conversation with Butler about his inbound pass because I you know, old dog trying to learn a new trick. Mm -hmm. I want to know how he does. So anyway, um, what happened was, I didn't know anything about force, except I knew a little bit about it through Troy. Troy and I had talked, and Troy loved doing force. He said um, that was much more rewarding to him. Well, ex explain, explain what force is for those that don't know. Okay, so force. I'm sorry. The Force is the AAA team or the developmental league for Team USA. And um, I think, what do we have, 16 guys on that team? Yeah. Okay. And 12 traveled, is that right? I think that's right. Um, what it is, maybe. I think that's right. Anyway, what it, what I mean, we, we, all, we all actually went to Switzerland, or we were all... Yeah. If we wanted right, to, we were right all on. able to go to Switzerland. Uh, but I remember being at Lakeshore. I guess we had everybody there, too. Anyway, um, essentially the force is a developmental team to prepare guys for Team USA and for international competition and to develop guys' skills, mindset, all of the above. And it's supposed to be for younger guys who someday will, will wear the red, white, and blue, and win gold medals. That's what it's for. And um, Dave and I had been, Dave Cerruti, and I had been on a couple of USA teams and friends for years, and he called me and said, are you interested in being an assistant coach? And I said, well, what do you mean? What's that about? And he explained it to me, and I said, yes, absolutely. I would love to help develop young athletes, because that's something, you know, I'm a teacher by nature, and it's something I love doing. And um, as you might remember from my earlier story, maybe I'm not a conventional teacher, but still there's lots of ways to teach people things. And so when he told me about this, I was all in. And so he said, okay, well, you, you need to be interviewed first. I went, okay, all right. He says, I can't just hand you the job. I said, okay. So we did an interview. There was four people on the panel, all by phone. It took like two hours. And... I don't want to get Ruby in any trouble, but he basically said, you got the job, just do the interview. I was like, <laughs> okay. So anyway, the bottom line is um, I got hired to do this, and I think we were together two years. Is that right? Uh, 15, they 15? they shut it down before the whole two-year cycle actually completed. I think it was yeah. more it. like uh, just over a year, it seemed like, because the second season, I think we did like one camp. So. So I was not there for the tryout. I was not there for that. I couldn't get away from work. I remember I that. In Birmingham. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. So, but, um, I, I cherish those moments. That was really quality good stuff. I liked it a lot. Well, I think and the, um, in fact, I, recently, I recently told Gumby, if you guys ever do anything like this again, count me in. I would like to continue on that level of developing athletes because I, I like it. It's, it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Yeah. They, uh, they, they changed it now. It's like now, you know, they, they got, I mean, my team was the last team force and then we pretty much got funding yanked out from underneath us. 
um, for whatever reason. That wasn't ever really explained to me. But um, no, I, it, I think the U.S. team is going to be hurting in the next in the next quadrennial, in the next, you know, Paralympic cycle, I know Tokyo got pushed to 21, but, um, you know, after that, uh, it, w- once the, this crop of athletes, re- you know, starts retiring, I just, I don't see anyone really in that pipeline to come take their spot. And if you look at the current makeup of, you know, this Paralympic team, how many of them were former um, Team Force alumni? Uh, uh, yeah, guessing well like over two, well over half of them. I think only two that I can think of. What do you think? Uh, was Wheeler on? No. Ever? No. He was, no. Not. He was already. And by the way, Wheeler was my answer, trivia question answer, to probably the biggest impact USA level spinal cord anymore. Um, but. I think uh, Lee Fredette is on that squad. Yeah, well, and, that's a um, former Force guy. He was he was on um, yeah, our team. And, uh, yeah, and he, he and I, um, you know, we, we talk at tournaments, et cetera. I just saw him at the Rays. He's a great dude, great guy. Yeah, Lee, uh, I love he, Lee. You know, he sold out, man. He, he, he sold out from going from New York. Um, not sure where he went next, but he's with U of A now. San Diego. Anyway, what I, mean, I don't mean sold out in a negative way. I mean, he put rugby as number one and went for it, and it's worked out for him. He's got one of the greatest success stories, and I want to get him on my podcast one of these days because I, I think the Lee for debt story is quite amazing. And he actually um, just got um, awarded, ooh, what was it? D D one or D two low pointer of the year. Oh, was he? I didn't know that. Yeah, that, cool. they tweeted it out. I'm I don't know. I'm not on Facebook anymore, so I don't get the news about the the rugby. Right. Um, well, I, I will say this though: while he has become a great player, you can't teach speed, and he's got speed. He is about the fastest one I've seen in a long time. So, oh, for sure. Um, but, but, I mean, he's also working every day with Chad Cohn. And Chad is one of the greatest low pointers in the history of the game. Um, I know he's a 1-5 here in the States, but he's a 1 internationally. And I had the opportunity to play and coach with him for three years. And he's one of the smartest guys ever. Yeah. He's just he's great, too. And he's he's a, very articulate. He's a good teammate, too. Um, you know, when I was on Team US, he was uh... – he wasn't voted yeah. team captain, but he was kind of the. Oh, dude! He's, he's he he the was engine. he was the um. Like the the senior player, you know, because he'd been on the team the longest, so he had he had a lot of respect from uh, his teammates, um, and he's he's just a great guy. Now he has a fair amount of function too. However, I do truly believe he's the one five. And he's a one international. I, I, I can't figure out an international anyway. You know, I mean, it, 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 things are a bit watered down. I'll just put it that way. Uh, but that's for, for some people. Going. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. I'm in the, uh, I'm in the rare group of, uh, group yeah. of yeah, you're, athletes you're, that are, that are the, actually classed I up. The in their category. I, it, when I heard that, I was like, what? You went the opposite way. Well, you know what? The, um, the good news about this whole coronavirus postponing uh, the Paralympics is they're, they, they haven't made it official yet or anything, but there is a possibility that there might be another tryout um, later, oh, really? later in the year. Um, and that, you know, that might give me the opportunity uh, to go get reclassed at an international tournament before tryout. So who knows? I mean, all, all I can do is uh, just be ready and, did you uh, listen to the podcast we did with Gumby? I haven't yet. Um, I will. Uh, that was one of our. That was one of our questions. Yeah. Will there be another tryout, et cetera, et cetera? And um, the short answer was, we don't know yet. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't heard anything on uh, on my end. So. 
pretty much it's just like just be ready i mean we got we got our workouts issued to us from the um, the head trainer so just got to go off of that, talk about that sorry go ahead i was going to say let me talk about that for a moment uh the difference in making team usa now versus back when i was playing at that level so every year if you did well and your team was fairly high profile or even if it wasn't if you did well and you were on the radar, you got invited to a tryout every year right after nationals. Nationals was always in April. Tryout was usually in June, something like May or June. And um, there were typically 42 guys invited to this tryout, um, six people for each classification, and they picked a team. And that team was for that year. That's it. You got another tryout the next year. There weren't six or seven camps and tryouts, you know, per year or anything like that. In fact, there was that one tryout, and then we would have one one week camp somewhere. If we were going overseas, it usually was in Boston or New York, um, if we we're going to Europe. And that was it. The rest of the year, you were expected to stay in shape and be on your own because something could come up. But it was also everybody was out of their own pocket. You had to raise money or have money to go. Team USA wasn't paying for anything. Things have changed a lot. Yeah, it's um, it, it's definitely gotten better. Um, I think it can still improve just because you hear like stories about how well the other countries have it. Um, and it just seems like the U S in general just doesn't really see the value in, um, disabled sports. Yeah. Things have changed. What did Benjamin Franklin say? Three things are no, two things are definite. Right? Taxes and death. And then somebody else said, and change. And there you have it. Things change all the time. Where um, we can actually uh, wrap it up, but um, let's uh, talk real quick. Where do you see the biggest changes coming for the next like ten years? Like, where do you where do you think the league will be in ten years? Um, well, one thing that's going to dictate a lot of change is the free agency rule. I believe. Um, it's going to be, I think, more division between the haves and the have-nots. And teams that have money, have reputation, have, you know, the players you want to play with, people are going to want to get out of their situation and go play with them, and they're going to be recruited hard. Yeah. So that's one thing. I think the international, the import rule, I think something's going to happen. I'm not sure if it's going to be no more imports or there's, there's going to be some change there, I think. Um, I'll just give you an example. We went from like 17th to 8th this year because of one player. And, uh, you know, I, I've always been in favor of inclusion. So I'm not against it. I'm just, I think some people would be against it. Yeah, um, I, th I think it's already like that now. Um other than that, I don't know, man. I don't have a crystal ball. I do think I agree with you, unfortunately, in the United States. If we don't get our shit together and have a better way of preparing young athletes, we're going to have a dry spell. And who knows? Maybe that means we won't be on the podium. We should be. We have the most athletes in the world eligible to play. And we got the biggest um, league as well. But it's like you said, man. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball or a solution, but if we're not developing athletes all the time, we're going to run into some hard times. And I, and I also think the fact that we can't um, supplement or pay or in some way incentivize 
our athletes the way other countries do, that's going to be an issue. Because to expect guys to be 24-7, 365 rugby, and yet give them a stipend every month that, you know, would be the same as welfare is, is not fair. Oh, it's, it's, hard it's not do. even, yeah. I mean, people it's that are panhandling are making way more. Yeah. I mean, uh, honestly, I could have done, I know athletes back in the 90s that chose not to go to USA um, to international tournaments and they would have made the team and not gone because they couldn't afford it and they were too shy about fundraising. I did fundraising all the time. I, I had a great core group that helped me out. But, it's, dude, everything's expensive. Taking a plane anywhere is expensive and, you know, hotels and blah, 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 blah. It's, um, it's hard. It's hard. And, um, you know, if you don't have a sponsor or you're not independently wealthy or you're maybe not a vet or whatever the situation, it, it's, I think, going to create more division between other countries and us and our athletes being able to get the proper training and play on, you know, those teams, especially with free agency, it's it all is connected. I think. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll just have to see how it plays out. I guess. 